Well, I usually start out by saying this is an oral history interview with uh, Senator Nancy Landon Kassebaum Baker. Right. Uh, for the Robert J. Dole Institute of Politics at the University of Kansas. And we're in the law offices of ba uh, Baker Donaldson. Today is Thursday, April 16, 2009, and I'm Brian Williams. I wanted to start out by asking you uh, your first awareness of Bob Dole and... Well, you know, I... I probably was 1968. Um, my husband, Phil Kassebaum, was a strong supporter of Nelson Rockefeller at that time. And um, I remember we went to the Republican National Convention in Miami, uh, in which Senator Carlson was the favorite son and sort of kept everything. But Senator Dole was very much a part of, of that uh, uh, whole political structure at that point. And of course, but I, I never really followed that much or got involved that much at the time he was in the House of Representatives until he went to the Senate. And of course then Bob has always been a name that was an important name in Kansas. And uh, my first real real association with getting to know Bob was then when I announced I was going to run in 1978. So it's a leap of time in there where I sort of was on the outside looking in and uh, watching Senator Dole from afar. But in many ways everybody sort of felt they knew Senator Dole and I suppose that is a winning quality. Right. Uh, when he was in the House, he represented a district in pretty much far western. Kansas. Yes. And well, it's well. I was in the fourth congressional district, um, and uh, now we always say the big first district takes off. We're half of Kansas almost, because uh, it's a sparse population out there. Um, <clears throat> but. Uh, it was one that uh, he'd had a real contest, as I've looked back on it and heard people talk about it, at that point. But I think that's what really grounded him uh, for the rest of his political career in active politics. And probably still grounds him even today. I'm, I'm a strong believer that your roots are there and you may not get back as often, but that's really what keeps you grounded. And of course, I miss not being back out at the farm, which I still have out there, but <clears throat> um, split time now between Tennessee and Kansas, so not Washington anymore. Not, not really at all? N seldom. Um, is there something that uh, distinguished Western Kansas from the fourth and the eastern districts? Or, or I think so. I think it was a sense of, uh, you know, most of rural America and most of our farmers and ranchers are very independent, and they admire that independence. That. Uh, sort of strength of that one gets from uh, the, the struggles frequently that farmers go through. You're there on your own a lot, in, and particularly in those days. And um, I, I think it still is true. I've always said I'd rather talk to a group of ranchers and farmers than anybody else, because they could tell you you were dead wrong and if you said, well, well, I don't think so, and let me tell you where we differ, they respect somebody who'll stand up and tell it straight. And they may never like you very well, but then <laughs> they respect that. It's an independence, and I think Bob had that. He grew up. Uh, he grew up that way, and then even through the war, experience that even further, I, I believe, maybe solidified a real sense of um, what it takes to have that backbone of steel. Right. Um, he had a difficult race in 1974 uh -huh. and barely won. Right. 
were, did you play any role in that? Well, not much. Uh, I really didn't, except uh, supporting him, but he uh, ran against Bill Roy, and it was a very close race. And uh, not that, again, I was paying all that much attention, but looking back, people say, well, abortion became a real issue, and that that, at the last, may have been what tipped it to Bob. I don't know. I leave that up to those who <laughs> know it better at that point. But that's why when I ran in 1978 against Bill Roy, in, as people were getting ready for that race, they felt Bill Roy would be very hard to beat. But a lot of people went back to saying 74 and what a hard race it was and difficult race. And I think it was difficult. But I think it was largely, of uh, course, um, just the time at that point. Uh, the, uh, 74 was Watergate. Uh, all of that was roiling sentiment, Vietnam. And Roe v. Wade. And, and Roe v. Wade, of course. Uh, so, and I think Roe v. Wade, if I had to say not knowing that much, was really probably what tipped it at that point, given everything else that was happening. Did the abortion issue come up in your race? No, because we had the same position. I, always, I remember uh, my dad was opposed to my running for the Senate, so um, mother was supportive. And I look back and I'm not quite sure what propelled me to jump in because I'd never planned to, I always was interested in politics and public affairs, but never was a particularly active participant. So I didn't have the support of the Republican establishment. I'm sure Bob was surprised I was doing it as well. But I remember the, uh, I talked to my father the night uh, before I announced, and he said, what do you think you'll be asked at your press conference? And I said, well, I'm sure I'll be asked my position on abortion. And there was a long pause, and he said, well, what business is that of the government? And uh, I said, well, that's what I've always thought, too. And I've always said from the very beginning, I support choice. I think that that should be up to the family and the church, the mother. And um, I respect those who hold differing views. And I was always picketed quite a bit. But um, I think also, again, people respect you for being honest. So you didn't have to do any special you didn't have to compensate, so to speak, for taking a position that a portion of the populace was opposed, strongly opposed to. Well, how do you know? What do you mean? What portion is opposed? Well, that's a good question, although it appeared to be decisive in the... In, in the 74? In 74, yeah. Well, it came right at the last of that campaign. And the churches that wanted it were very aggressive. Now, uh, they may have uh, been aggressive, but it, both of us were the same position. So the larger issue probably in 78 was the Panama Canal Treaty. And uh, in my race, there, there were eight of us in the primary. And um, that was frequently asked, what position? And nearly everybody said, well, they hadn't read the treaty. They, would have to, they couldn't comment without knowing for sure. And I said, well, I would have supported it because I believed in the long run that was going to be a benefit to us. And um, so I don't even know what bill, I think by that time we got to the, the general election, it had sort of faded away. I don't even know what Bill Roy said about it. But in the primary, that became a big issue. Was abortion an issue, too, in the primary? In the primary, some, yep. Mm -hmm. But uh, Jan Myers had the same position I did. Um, 
I, I can't, and you know, no, we were probably equally sort of divided on that. I'm not sure how it worked. And it was, and that was the year of the tractorcade, a lot of unrest in, in rural, they wanted 100% sub, subsidy for wheat. And it was the uh, American agriculture movement. And I have to say one of the biggest assets to me at that point was Bob Dole and I had the same position. We did not support 100% parity. And if I had been out there saying, because Bill Roy did, <laughs> if I'd been out there by myself saying I didn't support it, uh, that would have been a, a hunk of votes there that would have gotten very agitated. You came to Washington to work for Senator Pearson. For one year. Mm -hmm. And what motivated that? Why, why did you well, come? because I was separated at the time and I thought maybe uh, coming in, uh, to Washington in a year away would sort of help see how things were working out. It was a personal decision and I uh, actually called Senator Pearson to see uh, we'd been supportive of Senator Pearson, particularly my husband had been a campaign uh, worker, a chairman in uh, Wichita for him, and um, if there was anything at the State Department uh, that, because I had always been interested and got a master's degree in, in um, diplomatic history, thinking of teaching in the college level, and didn't, but um, he said, well, I have a position open as caseworker. So I said, well, great, for a year, and packed up the family, and we came to, my oldest had started college, and so the other three, and we lived here for a year, and, and saw a lot of the area, and spent the weekend sort of seeing the countryside, and the special places to see back here, and then anxious to get home. But it, it did give me an opportunity to know uh, casework, <laughs> and write my own letters and type them as well. Uh, and that most of the business of an office is pretty nitty gritty, that you don't come the, to Washington to save the world. But on the whole, it was a, it was a good experience being here for that year. I think so, yeah. We, well, I certainly used it in my campaign. <laughs> that I had worked in Washington for a year and I had been a caseworker and I knew it. I didn't have a whole lot to draw on, you know. As one of my uh, opponents in the primary said I was just running on my father's coattails and I finally said, well, what better coattails to run on? <laughs> But you campaigned as, as a Washington insider, too, is that right? No, 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 no. I never thought of myself ever as a Washington insider, but um, I, it, it was an interesting experience. And through that time, though I remember the 74 campaign only peripherally, and I never really, um, even when I came in 75, I, I don't recall seeing Senator Dole all that often. I didn't, I was focused on the back office and trying to keep up with doing my letters and invariably I had to go retype them over. <laughs> and so um, it, was, uh, it was an interesting time, but I never dreamed of running for office and coming back. It was never ever on my agenda. Did you uh, play any role in uh, the vice presidential campaign of Bob Dole in 76? Not a lot, no. You did? I mean, I was back home and supported him, of course, and supported uh, the ticket. But, um, I mean, I wasn't... Uh, Were you making speeches on his behalf? Well, no one asked. I don't think anyone would have necessarily thought of it. So you returned to Kansas in 76, and then sometime in 77? No, 78. 78, so... When I mean, everybody, well, everybody time thought time. Senator Pearson was going to run again. And friends of mine who'd been always active in his campaign in Wichita were gearing up, and so, you know, I would have lent my support to his re-election. And then when he decided not to, uh, these same friends said, well, you ought to consider running. And I said, well, I'll think about it. And I um, uh, did, and then, by, then Jan Myers jumped in early, and then a lot of the others were jumping in, Norman Garr, Sam Hardage, Wayne Angel. 
And then when Jan did, I, she was the only woman in the Kansas Senate. And I had a high regard for Jan. I said, well, another woman's in the race. I probably shouldn't get in. And they thought, well, that's kind of silly reasoning. And, uh, and waited. And I said, well, I'm going to wait till the first of spring, and then I'll make a decision. And so I did on March 1st and decided, even though Dad was adamant against it, I think he thought I would lose. And uh, But my, my a former husband was very supportive of my doing it. And, uh, you know, most politicians say they're going to ask their family. And <laughs> I've said you do that, but on the other hand, it's something deep inside you that uh, you really decide you, would, you could do and would like to do. Because it is a personal decision. And not an easy one. I wouldn't have done it with small children. My youngest at that point was a senior in high school. And when I ran um, and announced I was running, I really think Bob probably, as well as Jim Pearson, pretty much stayed out of the primary because there were a lot of friends on both sides that were running in that primary. By both sides, I mean either friends of Senator Pearson or Senator Dole. So you talk, did you talk over the prospect of running uh, with Pearson, with Dole, no. or just with your dad and a few friends? Well, mostly with friends. Dad was opposed. Mother supported. My, my mother-in-law was supportive. Uh, I think friends, as my treasurer said, who's a lawyer in Wichita, said, uh, well, I signed up as your treasurer because I didn't think you'd make it through the primary. <laughs> and so it was, a, it was a great time because it was a loose organization of really friends. I, I, I look back and I analyzed it at the time. You don't just jump in for the fun of it. By the time I announced, there were, most of the candidates were from the eastern part of the state. There were maybe only three of us you could truly count as being sort of west of the middle of the state. And uh, we were so divided, such a large number. If there had only been two men and myself, I'm not sure whether I could have won it. But it was so divided that by that time I thought, well, we'll see what happens. So without all, I had the, I, I was interviewed in January by the Republican National Committee chairman was there and the state National Committee chairman and um, Huck Boyd and uh, others who said, oh, Nancy, you know, you're going to need to get a campaign manager and you've got to get these consultants and so forth and so forth. I said, well, I tell you, if I don't know my own state and what I think, then I'm not sure I would want to do this. So I, I didn't. I dragooned friends in and had uh, friends who volunteered daily to run things and um, I do I do have to say that I had in that primary and then general election but the primary one of the best cameramen uh, filming that I've I've seen he, he did a great job Bob Sand who went on to do a few other campaigns but never really probably stayed with it as much as that film so it was a pretty um, amateurish in a way, but uh, dedicated supporters. And as I look back on that, we all had a, a good time because I think um, there were very few who really thought yeah, I would win. But they were also all people interested in in public affairs and, and for a lot of women who got involved they went on later to run for city commission seats and school boards and things like that so I think it's a plus when you are out there encouraging that involvement. After you won the primary and going into the general election uh, did you have to make changes to your campaign style? And was well not the style necessarily but of course then everybody becomes your your friend and longtime supporter and, but no to tell you the truth the people like Wayne Angel, uh, Daryl Schuster, others, Sam Hardage, and Jan Myers all lent strong support to help me. 
those who had been uh, we had been in the ca uh, primary together. But it was at that point that Bob Dole was an enormous help, and particularly as the campaign moved along, because I remember well Labor Day weekend, Bill Roy released his tax statement and called on me to release mine. And um, I made the decision right then I would not because my husband and I weren't formally divorced yet at that point. And so it had been a joint return. And I said it isn't fair to him to release that statement because that's his business as well. And I will not release it. Well, <laughs> I went way down after coming off a primary with ratings high and Bill Roy. I often, I ask Bill after a campaign was over, why did you do that so early? If you'd waited till the last two weeks of the campaign, I'm not sure I could have overcome it. And he said, well, I had to show early that uh, you weren't just riding a wave and you could be bumped off. But the trouble was he went with that through the campaign and by November people were tired of hearing it. But up until the last two weeks even, I bet, I had everybody, including the governor at that time, Bob Bennett, saying, you've got to release your tax statement. I said, why would I do it now? The reasons are the same as then. And if I do it now, what have I accomplished? This, that's true. I won't do it. I guess I have to ask a question. If you and your husband had been filing uh, separately, would you have taken a different position? Or? Well, I've always, probably, yeah, because I, there's no reason why I wouldn't have. But I did feel that was not right. And of course, then by the next time around, we were divorced, and it's, it's always public anyway when you're in the Senate. Uh, so you said that Bob Dole played quite a role. He too. did, and really right at the last, he, he stumped around the state. And what Bob gave to it was, again, sort of like the good housekeeping seal of approval. It was, it's okay, you know, to, to elect Nancy. Uh, I think people weren't sure, weren't sure what I could do. And of course, I can understand that. I was unproven in any way. I'd never run in a campaign before. Uh, I served on the rural school board, but you didn't even have to campaign in those days. They were glad somebody wanted to serve. And um, so Bob was tireless in the last of going around and speaking. And particularly, I would have to say, through the first district where uh, I think there would have been a, grow, a sense of uncertainty. So I really valued that. I remember walking, being with him in Hugoton, Kansas in Labor Day, and it's, they kick off a big parade, Labor Day parade, and Bob and Elizabeth were right there. And that's the first, I think, see it would have come right after the primary, that uh, he was right there helping work the crowd with me. So you had several, a lot of joint appearances? Not a lot, but right there at the first, it was a big help. We Right after I won the primary, he was with me at a joint press appearance. And um, I, re I remember saying something like to, to Bob, when uh, the first one was in Wichita, right after I won. Uh, well, I'm glad you're not dad, because <laughs> you're more positive than dad has been. <laughs> Uh, or something like that, but he, he was a big help. And then he really campaigned a lot right at the end on his own. For you? For me. Mm -hmm. And did your father go out in the No, we were, no, but uh, you know, Dad was getting up in years at that, at, um, let's see, Dad would have been about um, 90 something, and uh, we did one joint appearance in Topeka mm -hmm. at a rally in the park. But uh, I remember Bob calling me about two, maybe two nights before the election. And he was up in some little town in, out in western Kansas, up north. And he said, you know, Bob, what you doing? 
Yeah, I said, well, actually, I'm sitting here with the children watching Sound of Music on TV. I said, I can't believe it. You're out campaigning for me. And here I am, sitting home watching television with the children. But he that, did. That story has made it into the literature. Has it? Uh -huh. Although I think the movie is a human movie. <laughs> was it? Involved, I think the sting. Oh, I, I don't think it was. Well, whatever it was, could have been. That was a good one, too. Yeah. Yeah, that makes a very good story. <laughs> yeah. Um, so at what point in the... Were you completely uncertain about the outcome of the general election, or were you getting polling information that... Polling information towards the last showed I was coming up. Mm -hmm. And that's always the right time to have it coming up. Exactly. exactly. So you get elected, and then you have the interim few months to mm -hmm. collect your thoughts and... I guess establish yourself in Washington, right? Right. Right. Except there, you know, was an interesting sequence there when Jim Pearson said he would retire early, so I would gain seniority. And not only that, but I've only come to appreciate how really extraordinary it was. But because of Dad, and Bob may have had a lot to do with this, uh, because of Dad, they swore me in in Topeka. So Bob, Jim Pearson, uh, the Secretary of the Senate, um, all came out to Topeka and I was sworn in there. And as uh, Pearson uh, family tell it, I had never heard it uh, till recently that the official resignation papers hadn't gotten to Topeka. They'd been waylaid somewhere. And so Pearson just wrote on a paper napkin, Fritz, I quit, Jim. <laughs> But it was really very, you know, it was very special because Dad was there and, and, of course, Mother and the family and a lot of friends. And then I was sworn in again. But the other side of that story is that, of course, I gained seniority over a lot of people who couldn't imagine, I'm sure, in my class at the Republican side, this whippersnapper all of a sudden up here with his seniority. Dave Durnberger was the same. Muriel Humphrey retired early to give him seniority in Minnesota. But the Republicans under Howard Baker, when he became majority leader, changed the rule that you could no longer gain seniority by, by being sworn in early. I said, well, that's a fine thing. But it, it enabled me to move up, of course. And that was a real advantage, actually, because you realize, like when I became late chairman of the Labor Committee, though, that that does matter. Um, you, of course, were the second woman to be elected on your own to the United States Senate after Margaret Chase Smith. Right. Well, that's true. That's true. And, of course, Margaret Chase Smith had followed her husband in the House and then ran for the Senate and, of course, did very well then. So what kind of a welcome did you get when, when you uh, came in? Oh, fine. And Bob had a reception and, you know, Bob was very helpful. Uh, yeah, but, um, you know, the Senate has its traditions and I still think I remember Senator Luger used to laugh and say, let one in and then look what happens. <laughs> Gradually more and more women came. And I used to say, well, it's just the good thing when I left was it wasn't a big deal anymore. You know, women are there, women will always be there. And I frequently would ask, well, shouldn't there be 50% women? What if the Senate had 50 women and 50 men? And I said, I don't think much would change. Women are just as interested in gaining leadership positions. Women are just as interested in how they can achieve success with legislation. You know, I don't know that necessarily it would change that much. I think when I came in, I have to say, I probably wasn't as aggressive as, say, my good friend Barbara Mikulski might be. <laughs> but 
uh, it was a long time before I ever went into the really private dining room where only senators can have lunch. And there's a Republican table and a Democrat table. And it's across from the more open where you can take guests. And it was a long time before I went in there to have lunch. And I think actually Bob took me in first, said, come on, let's go on in and have lunch today in here. I'm not sure I may be embroidering. That may be one memory has failed me and I've made up. But I, he, would, he would do something like that, you know, though, I think. And it's not that I was ever particularly close on issues except the tractorcade. And I, boy, I remember that. Because there was a huge group from Kansas and they were mad as could be. And I, I knew some who'd lost a farm, and I'm sure he had two out in western Kansas. And it was just a hard time. And uh, he and I both met this huge group in one of the big Senate caucus rooms. And uh, the fact that we both had the same position was just an enormous strength to me. I mean, that was January. I mean, we'd, I'd barely been there. Mm -hmm. Some people are not going to know what you're talking about. So the tractor cane, yeah. So, so just and the hundred percent parity issue, yeah, you know, at that time for um, wheat. So, um, what what committees would you, did you want to get on, and were you successful at that? Or? Well, uh, when I first came, uh, and uh, we were in the minority still. I would have liked to have gotten on the Foreign Relations Committee, and I didn't. Once after the 1980 election, and we were the majority, I did then. I was on the Budget Committee and the uh, and Commerce Committee, and chaired Aviation, and chaired African Affairs on Foreign Relations. Those were the early committees. And right. Banking. I didn't really want to go on banking, but it, <laughs> it was a third committee pick which you could get and at one point and they, no one else had gone on, so I went on. So you started out on banking and? Let's see, when I started out and we were in the minority, I would have been banking, commerce, budget. That was probably it. And then foreign relations came along. After the 80 election. And then labor. Oh, that wasn't until 1990, let's see, 93, 92, maybe 92, or 93. Um, we were still, uh, it was when we were still minority, we had gone back to minority again. I think it, it, it was a couple of years before I chaired it. Yeah, 88 to 97, and you were chair 94 to 97, was what I found on the internet. Right. Well, that's right. I was. So, you, uh, you what, did you have me going on in 1988? What did I say? In labor. You said early 90s, I think. Anyway, that's. Yeah, I should look that up. It was, it was 88 to 90. I was several. I was in the minority when we had the big health care debate, the Hillary Clinton's health care plan. So that would have been 92, Three. 93. So probably went on, I don't think I went on much before 90. It was the big shift and uh, it was the election when Orrin Hatch, I went on the committee uh, at the time, Orrin Hatch was still there, but I moved up because everybody else had gotten off. So I could move up, and I was right next to Orrin, and I knew that he was interested in going to judiciary if we ever made a change in chairman. And uh, so that's what uh, prompted me to switch to labor and get off commerce. Your class of 78 was a pretty remarkable one. Uh, just in, uh, looking over some mm -hmm. of the names of the people that came in. Um, and Senator Simpson said you all spent time together when you first got there, Democrats and Republicans, mm -hmm. meeting once a month and so forth. Yeah, we had a good, uh, it was a congenial group of both sides of the aisle. Mm -hmm. And it was a turnover of a fifth of the, of the Senate that year. It was, yeah. Uh -huh. What if you came in? 
I think what changed it um, after the 80 election was a lot of House members came in and then that was particularly true there for for several years and even now but it changed the dynamic a little bit of the Senate I think because as its story is told that in the House for so long House Republicans were in the minority they given the chance to swing the majority they by golly were not about to negotiate <laughs> and I think then it began to change a little bit and then the television of the Senate and you've got all the other things that changed but it was a congenial group and you know uh, uh, I think we all were very because we did work well with the in within the committees I think uh, I, I can't tell you what it was. I think we were lucky to have chairman, our leaders like Baker and Dole, um, both who were men of the Senate, essentially. Yeah. Um, talk a little bit about the Kansas delegation at that when you came in. Um, did you all meet together a lot? And was not a lot. <laughs> was it a cohesive? It started. Group? Well, I think so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it started out, I think that we met, I don't think we met as much as some other states did, but uh, it, it, worked, uh, it worked pretty well. And uh, I think we kept in good contact with everybody. Uh, Dan Glickman was the Democrat uh, from the 4th District. But on the whole, you know, we all talked together when there were, when there were problems. Bob was, uh, of course, determined to have as many Republicans there as possible, and and so was I. But uh, he never let that, I think, really unduly uh, influence his personal relationships. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm, I'm just trying to remind myself when he became in '85. He became the the, uh, the leader. That's right. Yeah. Um, and. What was your observation of that? How did, did he change? Uh, I don't think so. You mean in comparing the style with Baker? I I think Bob was uh, Howard was more. Um, I think is letting the chairman of the committees sort of conduct their their legislation as it came to the floor and so forth. I think Bob was more hands-on as a leader to say, well, let me see if I can work these things out. I think there was a little bit of a difference in style. I don't think particularly as it related across the aisle uh, to the Democrats, I think both of them had good rapport on both sides of the aisle. Uh, but I think in leadership style, a little bit of difference there. I think not enough that it necessarily influenced uh, people. And I, I have to say, I'm sure I was a bit of a thorn in Bob's side on occasion because I, I, my votes didn't always agree with either Baker or Dole. <laughs> and, and I know some votes when Bob was leader uh, that uh, I'm thinking of uh, a couple that I am sure were difficult. One was overriding President Reagan's veto of the uh, sanction bill in South Africa. And I chaired the African Committee at that time. And, um, and both, and Senator Luger was chairman, and he was supportive of overriding the veto too. Uh, I'm sure that was hard for Bob. As leader, he had to support the veto. But I think in his heart, that was not what he would have wanted to do. Uh, we parted ways on gun control issues, usually, and those became sort of difficult for me on one occasion when I was one of the few Republicans who supported gun control legislation. Uh, but uh, Bob was always very respectful of letting me either sink or swim on my own. And he never tried to twist my arm. There was only one time I remember he sent Senator Byrd up to see me. 
I don't think Bob would have said anything himself, and it was whether we uh, a vote on increasing our own pay, which was always, you know, a hard vote politically as well as sometimes just hard to do. Uh, and this particular time was difficult, but Byrd supported it and Dole supported it. And I, I, Senator Byrd came out and said, now you know we need to get this vote, Nancy. And I know how you feel, I know how you've voted in the past, but you have to do this. And I did. But that, uh, I think, was probably a message to me that this was really important. And Bob shouldn't be left out there on his own. Because it never is popular. How did you see uh, Bob Dole and his relations with Ronald Reagan in the White House? Well, you know, I, I wasn't that close to knowing how. Uh, I'm sure I, I would think okay. Well, I mean, in terms of his having to carry the water for, for the White House on, on, on this issue and many others. Well, he always did. He, you know, I, I think, I know on the, uh, the sanction issue uh, in South Africa and the question of apartheid there, um, he uh, w went with us to the White House, Luger and myself to the White House to discuss it with President Reagan. Um, and uh, so I think, you know, he probably tried uh, in ways that I wouldn't know necessarily on some issues to uh, try and get the White House to think a little bit about what was happening. There was a lot of, of uh, give and take and confusion on a transportation bill. Now see, I was not a highway bill. And I think Elizabeth at that time was Secretary of Transportation. And I, I remember just a lot of <laughs> White House and and the Senate and vote, and it was, we, did he veto it? We had to come back and redo it, I sort of forget. But it was, I'm sure there were issues that, for Bob in a leadership role, he, he had a lot of different things he had to juggle in the air. And uh, I think he always, you know, he did that very well. On fiscal matters, were you really pretty much in sync? I would have thought so. Were you for the balanced budget amendment, for example? Oh, no, I wasn't. I always thought a constitutional amendment was silly. I support a balanced budget, but I said, having it a constitutional amendment, we'd find ways that we would show we had done it. We could move a lot of things off budget, which we tend to do now, too. Um, and I didn't think that was the answer to really a strong fiscal policy. And what was your take on... And I'd supply? always said that, even when I was campaigning. What was your take on supply-side economics? Well, yeah, you know, it worked for a while. <laughs> Is that what we do now with a stimulus package? Are we doing supply-side economics? I mean, I don't know. I personally feel, to tell you the truth, that as Republicans, I've been very disappointed we have not been stronger in really, we talked a lot about fiscal policy, we talk a lot about smaller government, but it just simply grows. And that is having the ability to make sure in you know, your departments and so forth, you aren't just adding to, you're being willing to be consistent and reduce, not expand. And we've expanded, I think, with... Um, uh, political appointees, and that's grown. And, you know, it's easy to say from the outside, but uh, I, as a Republican, I'm very disappointed, and I think that uh, uh, we, we talk a lot about contracting out. Well, that doesn't really shrink our spending at all. In fact, and as a matter of fact, you could say it might increase it. So I, you know, I don't know. I'm, I'm in that regard, when you say supply-side economics, I, I don't remember a particular vote, but I may have 
Well, I was looking at the when Ronald Reagan first came in, and and there was the uh, ERTA uh, tax bill, and then oh, the next yeah. year it was TEFRA, which uh, corrected some of the thing. And Bob Dole was quite critical in getting that passed mm -hmm, too, mm -hmm. somewhat against the wishes of the, of the White House. But I think that was probably good. Yeah, as a Republican, you probably uh, um, the kind of Republican you are would have been more um, receptive to some of the government programs that cost money. And well, so it wasn't you would never would you take a sort of slash and burn attitude towards saving money? Not slash and burn, but I would I certainly uh, spoke about uh, trying to reform our foreign aid monies. Uh, I believe strongly in those days of needing to find an answer to our entitlement programs, uh, that we needed to uh, find answers, better answers to a health care policy. And, you know, th those issues come and go as the crisis hits, but we never really take, I personally would increase gasoline taxes. I do support taxes. Maybe that's where I differ with Republicans. I mean, you can't have people out complaining about paying taxes who want still everything. And somehow there's no, there's nobody realistically sort of standing up and explaining this in, in a way that grabs the public's attention. Uh, I uh, actually, uh, we had a measure called the KGB legislation, Kassebaum, Grassley, Biden, that would have frozen all spending. What year was that? Uh, we can put it in the transcript. Yeah. Bob was would have been minority or majority leader. Well, majority. It was Reagan was president. Um, and it would have frozen defense, but it would have frozen uh, entitlements. It would have frozen everything. And at that point, there was going to be a tax, further tax reduction, and that would have been put on hold. So... Uh, our argument was that we needed to really take time to begin to pull in a bit and if you freeze everything, even inflation increase in Social Security, you've, you're, you're looking at it in maybe hopefully some different ways. Well, it had some support. Reagan didn't care for it at all. And I remember Ted Stevens being really upset um, because of it freezing defense. And, and also it would be regarded as a tax increase because you were not allowing that re further reduction. Uh, and I said, don't get so excited about it. It isn't going to pass. But <laughs> it's probably too simplistic. But it, it, it was, in a way, honest in that you had everything in it, at both ends of the scale. But it didn't work. And I, um, I was one of maybe just Senator Hatfield and myself at one time early on voting against a defense bill and frequently spoke not that I want to reduce any way our strength in defense but we need to re we need to be careful about what we do so that we're spending it with some thoughtfulness ahead and I really salute today Secretary Gates for what he's trying to do and it, it's tough it hurts a lot of industries in our own states and people on the payrolls and so forth. But Did Bob Dole have to corral you in often? Uh, no, that's why I say he was really very good. And I know there were times it must have been hard to have me out there where uh, <laughs> sort of out on the fringe and... and uh, it, but he, he was very, um, he, was, he didn't try and twist my arm ever, and neither did Howard Baker. Did you ever contemplate doing a Jeffords? Going no. No. You, you always, oh, no. You always have felt at home in the Republican Party. Well, I have until recently. 
Um, just a couple of other issues before we move on to a few other things. Um, let's talk about health care, mm -hmm. in, in particular the, the Clinton health care plan and how you received it. And, and Well, like most people, it was uh, sort of like dealing with a 500-pound gorilla. It was just too much. And I well remember I was in, in Topeka at the folks when I first heard the Harry and Louise ad. And I thought, uh-oh, that will really gain attention because all of us hate to have to push one, two, or three for anything. <laughs> at least I don't like to. And. Um, Certainly, if you're talking about health care, it's personal. And I think that's the reason it's always been hard to deal with, because everybody thinks, well, wait a minute, where, where do I fit in this? I've, I believe, though, those health care debates that we had, and Senator Kennedy was chairman at the time, uh, and I was ranking, that... Um, it was a good educational process. It certainly was for me, because we had almost two weeks of hearings. And uh, tried to make it something that was understood. Now you might, and we disagreed a lot on the committee as we went through it. But I think it was a good um, lesson, maybe, if anybody was really listening on, on health care. We're sort of right back in it now again. and. Uh, who knows how it will be resolved. Well, you and a number of other senators got together to try to make something of it. We did. We did, and worked towards some alternatives, as did Senator Dole, and was very involved. And I, I tried hard. I had a plan uh, that would have returned uh, some of the responsibilities the states had to the federal government and others back to the states and so forth, and not to go into a lot of detail. But um, we did, and then eventually uh, this, uh, the bill that we had on the portability bill uh, that with Senator Kennedy, um, we finally did get passed, but it was very, it was limited in certainly in many ways, but... Limited, but very successful. In well, it was. Uh, for, for some people, it was a big help. And I had some people, you know, you hear from people that it had helped their family, and that's when it really is worthwhile. Now, another part of it has become something that I almost dread going into a doctor's office, and because of HIPAA, <laughs> we have to have these forms all signed, and you know, and it's... It's been carried to an extreme because of the privacy provision that was added right at the last. But, but that is uh, probably one of the bills that you're very proud of. That and the aviation product liability bill, which really helped get general aviation back on its feet because finally after years of trying to work something out, uh, we were able to uh, get some uh, caps on liabilities uh, and without going into a lot of ins and outs of it that enabled because the insurance costs were just rising to extreme levels for the general aviation so plants like Cessna all of the Piper had almost had gone out of business really and then came back with so that was a big help was uh, Dole an ally on that one well, not strong at first because I think there were a lot of interests that were, uh, trial lawyers were very opposed. And um, one of the big lobbyists was Tom Korologos, I believe at that time. And uh, Tom is very effective. And uh, so uh, certainly Bob was in that he didn't, he wanted to help the aviation industry. Uh, but Fritz Hollings was very opposed, and I think Bob was only too glad to let someone else maybe um, work with it and not have to be one way out front necessarily on it. But I, uh, you know, I don't know what you might pick up from. Was that a close vote? I can't remember. Um, it's always a little bit of a surprise to me that aviation is, I, I never associate aviation with Kansas. Ah, no, but it's very, it's the home of avi general aviation. 
uh, just because we're so flat and I think that's always what prompted the uh, the beach and all uh, the Walter Beach and uh, uh, Wallace, Dwayne Wallace, and the early pioneers there too. And then Bill Lear came to Wichita and started Lear Jet there. And uh, so no, it's it's been the, uh, it's really been the center of some major. And Cessna's really, after that legislation passed, and Dan Glickman was very, very instrumental in the House in helping with that. And um, it, it was important. And um, uh, we went back and forth quite a while before it passed. We had to do a lot of compromising on it. And I'm not even sure, oh gosh, Bob was still in the Senate when it finally passed. Yes, he was, he was, yeah. And generally speaking, he was a friend of ABA. Of, uh, oh, sure. oh, sure, oh, sure. But he, I think, had some reservations about <laughs> exactly. I mean, he had the, the, a lot of pressure, I'm sure, for those who wanted to see uh, more compromises. And we finally worked something out. But. Um, he had aspirations, of course, for the presidency mm -hmm. starting in 1980. And I was a co-chairman of his campaign Didn't know that. with Bob Ellsworth. So you were strongly in favor of these. Well, the sure. I was, you know, I, I thought, gosh, I don't know what I can do to add to this, but I remember going down to Florida with one occasion for him and, um, at that point. And then again in 88, uh, were you with him then too? Sure. When I was out at Russell when he announced. Yeah. And how did you feel about things as, as 88 transpired? Oh, I would have been supportive of Bob. I don't even remember who else was running. Well, well of course. Coach, yeah, of course I do. <laughs> yes, of course I do. <laughs> uh, well, you know, but I would have always supported Bob. Uh, not just because he was a Kansan, but uh, he, he would have been good. And... Uh, I've heard a number of people say that that was really his year. Well, maybe. I suppose from the standpoint of him personally. That's what I mean. Mm -hmm. Health-wise and in age, well, I hate to say age for any of us, but, but on the other hand, competing with someone who'd served as vice president, to President Reagan, who was still very popular, was hard had to overcome a lot of chits that were out there for the Reagan administration. But Bob, um, Bob was very popular and you can hear all sorts of questions about having Jack Kemp and would someone else, you know, those are choices that you look back and you never know. And at the time, I'm sure it seemed a really good choice. Uh, but Bob, uh, well, I never looked at it that way, that that was his best year. Because it's surely, you know, 96 opened up, and that was. Now, whether... Um, by 96, things that were changed... I, you would think it would have been a good year. Who would have thought President Clinton would have come back like he did? That's right. Did uh, Senator Dole... Uh, confer with you at all about uh, putting his name in the in the ring for ninety six? No, not really. Uh, but I wasn't I wasn't what you would say part of anybody's counsel necessarily, and maybe I was too independent. <laughs> Did you campaign for him in ninety six? Well, that's uh, when I was winding winding down that year and we had the, our health care portability bill. Uh, I was still trying to get the National Tall Grass Prairie uh, Preserve passed and uh, a few things like that. I, I don't remember, I certainly would have, I remember in 88 calling uh, gosh 
she worked with him for years and was Joanne. Co. Joanne. Oh, I can think I was Jody. I knew it. Joanne. And saying, Joanne, I'm glad to go anywhere if I can be of help. And he was, he was I, I was in Illinois, I think, someplace. And I said, I'm happy to go up there if that will help in any way. She said, well, let me call you. If, but, you know, to tell you the truth, sometimes it works to have other people out there for you. And on that kind of scale, I don't know. What were your feelings as you watched the campaign progress? And In 96? Uh -huh. Well... Gosh, I don't know. I remember watching it. Howard and I were watching it with Bill Cohen and his wife. And that's before we were married. But uh, And we saw it just playing out, you know. And I think because Bill Cohen and we were all supporting Bob. Um, are you talking about watching the convention? No, on the television, the election night. The election night. Uh -huh. Well, I was at the convention, mm -hmm. and so was Bob uh, Howard. Um, what about that? What was it? Ninety-six hour nonstop campaigning I leading know. up to. Yeah, he was in Tennessee, and no, I wasn't there. And, and then, but yeah, I interrupted you when you were saying you and the Coens and... Well, I just remember being sad to see that happen because that would have, was really the last opportunity for Bob to do it and he handled it with good grace but I know it was a disappointment. What was your first contact with him after? Well, probably he came, they came to our wedding. <laughs> And how soon was that after the uh, election? Well, it was December 7th. Mm -hmm. It was right after. What, was that date chosen for any reason? Well, you'd wonder, wouldn't you? I said maybe so we wouldn't forget when we were married. <laughs> <laughs> um, but my mother died in the summer of 96, and I just had a lot of things on, and I wasn't asked to do anything, so I didn't really do anything very active politically in 96. Um, can you compare Dole as a candidate versus Dole as a Senate leader? <laughs> I think he was, in all honesty, a much better Senate leader than he was a candidate. For any particular reason? I think he enjoyed the Senate. Now that's interesting. I didn't, maybe he would say it wasn't that enjoyable, but I think it was. He enjoyed the give and take, the camaraderie. He could be his own person, particularly when the opposition was in the president's office. And he thrived on that. Bob was much better when he had that kind of give and take. But out on the campaign trail, he, it was much harder, or it is for anybody, I suppose, to be their own person. And I'm sure he was said, you've got to do this, you go do that. And he, he was just programmed to do so much. And he lost what I think is his greatest asset, is when it is a genuine sense of humor. And he can be very clever, he can be very humorous, he can be... Um, genuinely an exceptionally appealing person. But when he becomes sort of programmed to do something, it can come across as rather harsh and programmed and mean-spirited. And that's when I think he, he lost what in a way is the essence of Bob Dole's great strength. And it's one I admire a lot. I, I really feel that uh, it's too bad that in 96 that couldn't have been thought through a little better. Now, who am I to say? I'm very much an outsider in that sort of thing, but I just don't feel Bob was himself. So what motivated your, your resignation? In oh, well, I announced in November of 95 that I was not going to run in 96 and I wanted to go back to the farm which I still have in Kansas and babysit grandchildren. I had no idea, no idea whatsoever I would get married again and um, 
in 96, a mutual friend of Howard Baker's and mine said, how about going out to dinner with us? And I said, sure. And then I took another fork in the road. <laughs> and I still go back. It's a cattle, it's cattle, cow-calf operation. And my youngest son, his wife, do all the work. But I love being out there. So no regrets walking around? No, no, no. I, I was looking forward to retiring. I had said, in fact, one thing that I felt strong about is you should only serve two terms. And it, my first piece of legislation was a constitutional amendment to limit terms. I came to believe that that was not wise, that uh, it's voters that need to make that choice. I think you can serve too long. But then that's a choice that voters should make. And if you limit it, you're a lame duck then at some point, and you really do go through a period not being able to do much. Um, and even when I announced in November of 95, you know, you're sort of by 96 and everybody knows you're leaving. And, but you, you have to do it that way. And as people said then when I ran for a third term, well, you've, you said you were only going to do two terms. I said, well, you know, a woman can change her mind. And <laughs> I'm glad I did because it gave me a chance to be chairman of the Labor Committee and do some things that I might not have been able to do otherwise. Um, and quite a few of your class of 78 Left made it. the same choice. Mm -hmm. Did. Yeah, we did. I, you know, I don't know. I, I don't think any of us had any regrets. I wonder how much uh, the election outcome in 94 had to do with that, was it the Re Republican Revolution, quote unquote. Oh, well, I don't know. It was not a very productive period of time from the standpoint of some of us, I'm sure. We felt that was not wise how it sort of materialized. Uh, but um, I don't know. You said uh, to know Kansas is to know Bob Dole. Uh, I don't quite remember where I found that quote, but uh, what does that mean? No, I think it means that the essence of Bob was a real, uh, real grassroots independence in many ways, a determination. I mean, and I think that reflects on what he overcame in his recovery from the war. Uh, but um, mostly I can remember in early days seeing Bob, you knew that he was determined he was going to be able to button his shirt if he could. And those things that were hard for him to do. And I don't think certainly I didn't know and I'm guessing most people didn't realize what he had to do to really achieve day to day and I think that stems from a hardiness of spirit that he had from being really out in western Kansas Russell's pretty far out there and um, and winds, windswept prairie that uh, uh, he grew up with uh, with people who achieved by being pretty dedicated to what they were trying to do. Do you think other uh, Kansas senators shared some of those qualities? I think of Pearson and Carlson. And oh, you know, it's hard to say. Uh, there isn't a Pearson Kansas didn't grow up in Kansas. Carlson did. Um, I, I don't know. Western Kansas seems to develop a... And I think, again, I go back to his experiences in the war, probably, uh, whether it was the Kansas growing up that allowed him to handle that years of medical, but it was a determination to succeed. And you know that can come, I'm sure, other places. But uh, I think that certainly was an influence on Bob. So Kansas... But he's never gone back home, really. Yeah. And now the roots are pretty severed because a lot of his family is gone. 
I think about uh, World War II defining mm -hmm. him and lots I think of so. others in the Senate. Right. And then the Depression as being a defining factor as right. well. And it may be the same with your, your husband? Uh, well, he was, in the, uh, he was in the Navy, but he w was right at the last, and he went to the Pacific, but it was then at a cleanup operation. It was yeah. Um, uh, a couple, just a couple okay. more yeah. questions okay. here. Um, what are your either fondest or strongest memories of Bob Dole? Do you have any that sort of stand out? Oh. Well, I, I, you know, it's just when you saw Bob get a quizzical look in his eye and you knew that underneath that persona that he put on, there was a, there was another side. And uh, I told, I've often said he reminded me of Humphrey Bogart. And <laughs> I could always sort of see him saying, here's looking at you, babe. <laughs> but that was something that uh, I don't think he'd, I don't know whether he appreciated my saying he, I, he reminded me of Humphrey Bogart, but um, there was a quality there that, uh, you know, you could see he could be very moved easily. And uh, that's when you really appreciated the other side of Bob Dole. Did you spend any time with him sort of out of the realm of politics? No, not much. Uh -uh. Do you think many people have? Probably not. I, I couldn't answer that, but I don't. Did you go on any uh, congressional trips with him? Nor anybody. I, I don't. I didn't ever go on a Codell as such. I went with McCain to the Middle East in uh, January of '89. But the rest, I always went to Africa on my own. Never really wanted to do. Codell type things. I really wanted to be there just to see and visit with the... I mean, they were Senate trips, but they were not a big group. And I think you've really answered this, but uh, just one more statement on this theme. How do you think Bob Dole should be remembered? I think Bob should be remembered for having achieved a lot and maybe ultimately it might not be the small legislative things or the leadership that he's given as being who he is as a mentor to others that followed. And I'm not sure people really think about it that much, but if you go to the Dole Institute and I think see what he has done in keeping alive a certain memory of the World War II and those years and what he himself overcame. That's a legacy in and of itself that I th should be an inspiration. And I believe that he always uh, felt strongly about public service, but for me, I think what I would remember most is, again, as I said, his dedication and determination to really achieve, to do something worth, that he believed would be worthwhile. And I think he carried that through in politics, uh, and it was an ambition he had, and it was a driving ambition that I think kept him going. Uh, whether he would have been a good president, a great president, and he missed that, there's a legacy still of his striving to do that and bring to it the very best that he could. And that to me is a legacy, I think. And deep down, a caring uh, for that and for helping those who he believed needed an extra hand on the way up. And we think of ADA, for example, mm -hmm. as part of that. Mm -hmm. um, I have a last question, and that is, how, how do you think your era, the time you spent in the Senate, should be remembered? That block of history. Well, of course, those of us who were there then say it was the golden age. <laughs> and I think as you get older, you look back, we all, probably all do, with some nostalgia that it was a better time and maybe it wasn't. But I think we, we were there still when people 
didn't have such a dividing line we uh, us against them you know it was uh, at the end of the day you could you were friends uh, and I'm sure that that will come back but I think during that period of time you could have your differences but you still kept a friendship you respected someone uh, and you respected what people went through uh, in order to have their points of view perhaps or but uh, that's changed a lot I think today and there's all kinds of reasons why I think it's changed but I, I hope the atmosphere will come back right. let's just pause here for a second to Tom again I'm sorry Thanks for um, I want to thank you for this opportunity and the time you've spent with us today and your recollections well thank you it was uh, it was really a pleasure I think uh, it, it's important to jog one's memory and there were many things like the Americans for Disability Act that we didn't cover because I wasn't quite as involved in it but Harry, uh, uh, Bob had some enormous influence on legislation like that that was difficult to get through but it's been a significant change but I, I think that uh, the Dole Institute is a wonderful uh, tribute to Bob that uh, helps us all think a bit about what many things he accomplished and an inspiration to young people to achieve.